Now, I made an observation, and uh, it probably isn't surprising to anyone, but I, I thought I'd check and see if it, you know, make sure it's not just me. Um, if you've all noticed this too, and it seems like it's really accelerated over the last couple of years. Um, how many of you have noticed that people are just so easily offended? Anybody notice that? Yeah, and it's not like, like even at the drop of a hat anymore. It's like hair trigger, right? So you say you say one thing, or, or you look at someone the wrong way, or you wear something somebody doesn't like, and boom, ah, right? Uh, anybody experience that? And it's pretty much everyone too. It, it, it's Christians as well. Uh, and some of you may be thinking, yeah, but aren't we supposed to be offended in certain circumstances as Christians? Doesn't God call on us to stand for truth and righteousness, especially when it comes to sin and injustice? And, and the answer is, well, yes, sort of. Uh, but God tells us how we should go about doing that in his word. And I can tell you that it's not how the world is doing it. And it's not how a lot of us as Christians are doing it. So this morning, we're going to be beginning a, a new five-part series called No Offense. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how in our culture today, so many people are, are just so easily offended and incredibly angry. And... What our response is as disciples of Jesus to all the division and all the hatred and all the anger in the world, what our response should be. Uh, and I have to give credit to a couple of authors here. One is Ed Stetzer, who uh, I, I just recently read this book. Um, he wrote it a while ago, back in 2018. Anna and I actually I heard him speak as he was promoting this book uh, when we went to a small town uh, pastor's conference in Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's been in my pile of books to read. If you've ever been in my office, it's just piles of books I have to read. But, you know, when I, when I, I noticed how people just start to get instantaneously angry and outraged, I felt I really needed to read that book. Um, and then the second book is by Brent, uh, Brent Hansen, and it's a book called Unoffendable. Uh, this, was, this one was originally written in 2015, but it was just revised last year. So if you really want to know more about this topic, uh, if you're really struggling with it and you want to dig deeper than I can go into in you know, five short sermons, uh, I would recommend you pick up both, one or both of these. But I, ha I have to tell you for the most part that I'm pretty good about this, but I do feel the tension and I feel the struggle and sometimes it's hard. Uh, and the more it happens and the faster it happens, the harder it gets. But as followers of Jesus, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can stop being offended. And that's the title of today's message, Stop Being Offended. And so listen, if during this series I offend you, which is certainly a possibility, it's more likely a probability, uh, know that I do so with the goal of helping you to get over your offenses, your anger, and perhaps your unforgiveness. So let me introduce the big thought for today, really for the series, and it comes from the book of James. Now this was written by Jesus' uh, stepbrother, his half-brother here on earth, his earthly brother, one of his earthly brothers. Um, and we talked about James last week, about in Easter, uh, he, he did not believe Jesus was God until after the resurrection. He thought Jesus was a little crazy. Uh, but his life was completely transformed by that historical event, the resurrection. And James says this in chapter 1, starting at verse 19. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So let me ask, how are you doing on that assignment? We should be quick to hear, quick to listen, right? Slow to speak slow to anger. We're living in a culture that not only doesn't listen, but they really don't want to listen. Right? And they're super fast to speak and often instantaneously angry. We should be slow to speak, quick to listen. In fact, when you look at Jesus and the way he lived, that's exactly how we live. And as Christians, we want to love. We want to be like Jesus. Right? So here's some interesting trivia for you. How many questions do you think that Jesus was asked as recorded by the Gospels? 
How many questions do you think Jesus would ask as recorded by the gospel? I'll give you the answer. 183. Okay, 183 questions as recorded in the gospel. Now, out of those 183 questions, how many do you think he answered directly? That he directly responded to them with an answer? Every single one. No. Because he spoke in Bible probably a few. Three. Three out of 183. Uh, now, while he was asked 183 questions, he actually asked others 307 questions. Because Jesus was incredibly others focused. He was slow to speak and he was quick to listen. So as we think about this today, that's our assignment, to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. And I think anger's really evolved over the years. Uh, I mean, I would get angry when someone would cut me off in traffic. Usually if it's like at the last second, I pretty much have to slam on my brakes and then they do like 20 miles an hour into the speed limit. That would make me angry. Or, uh, you know, maybe someone doesn't respond to a text or an email or a phone call for a long time, or maybe not at all. Um, then I'll start to stew on that. Or maybe when you're in a movie and someone starts talking, or, or worse yet, they answer their phone in the middle of the movie and talk, or like the coup de grace, they actually pull out their phone and dial somebody and start talking. You know, that, that's, that's some anger stuff right there, right? But uh, seriously, those, those were the normal types of things we would get angry for. But anger's really escalated today, especially on social media. You know, I'm part of several groups on Facebook. Uh, and the, the sad thing is I had to leave a lot of them. Um, and, and what's really sad is many of them were supposedly Christian groups. Uh, because I would literally sit there and watch people be so unchrist like that it was toxic. It was becoming a cesspool. And, and I, I had to quit the group because I started to, guess what? Get angry, right? Now, whether it's politics or religion or gun rights or gender or sexual ideology or viruses or uh, vaccines or masks or pro-choice versus pro-life or border and immigration, those are like probably the major ones. But really, if you can think of it and you post something about it or say something about it, Someone is going to get offended, and they're going to get angry, and the outrage and the venom is going to follow. And here's the truth. None of that is pleasing to God. So I want to ask you the question, how effective is your anger? Right? Like, how's it going for you? If you're easily angered, is it working? Is it making you more like Jesus? Is your anger pointing others to the intimacy and the life and the freedom and the joy that's found in Christ? How effective is your anger? Is it making you more loving? Is it drawing other people into a more joyful life? And I'm going to give you a little spoiler, spoiler alert. The answer is no. Okay, and James, in fact, even says in verse 20, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Your human anger, whatever it is, your anger at the small offense or your anger at the, the major betrayal, your anger at the opposing political view or the guy who tells you you're number one with his finger in the parking lot, uh, whatever it is, your anger, your human anger does not produce the righteousness of God that he desires. And I know that some of you are thinking, you want to push back. You want to push back because I wanted to push back, right? I, I want to say, yeah, but what about righteous anger? Right? What about righteous anger? My anger is righteous because I'm angry over sin. And there is such a thing as righteous anger. But listen, loved ones, there are many times where Jesus was not happy with the things going on around him in the world. He was angry about them. But you know, of all those times, he only physically responded with anger once. That's when he flipped over the tables and drove the money changers out of the temple. There are certainly rare circumstances when it's necessary to be that direct, but 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not how Jesus handled it. And the other thing to remember is that Jesus is God. Right? Jesus was sinless. He's perfect. So his righteous anger was perfect. That's something to think about because typically... When we're angry about someone else's sin, it's someone else's sin. Have you noticed that? So if we're really honest, 
It might not be perfect righteous anger. It could be some self-righteous anger. Because as Christians, it's really easy to criticize their foul language, but ignore our own spiritual pride. It's easy to judge their sexual sin uh, and then ignore our gluttony. Have I offended you yet? Because I'm working my way around the room. Right? How effective is your anger? We tend to think our anger is justified, but why? Are you drawing people to the grace and the goodness and the love of Jesus Christ because of your anger? Is your anger bringing you more joy? Is it blessing and enhancing your marriage? Is it, is it giving your children or your grandchildren or your neighbor a life that they want to emulate? What we have to do eventually as followers of Jesus is we have to make a decision. Okay, we need to decide that when we get angry, do we want to make a point? Do we want to win the argument? Or do we want to make a difference? Okay, because too many people simply want to make a point. They want to win the argument. If we want to make a difference, I would submit to you, we need a different attitude and a different philosophy with dealing with the wrongs of this world. And rather than letting our flesh and our feelings and our emotions direct our actions, we need to let the Spirit of God direct our actions. So we're not just making a point, we're making a difference. We're not just trying to win an argument, we're trying to win people by the grace and the goodness of Jesus. And that's a very, very big difference. There was this really, really smart guy who was an expert in the law, and he came to Jesus, and he asked him a question. And this is a question Jesus actually directly answered, one of the three. So this guy comes up to Jesus and says, so tell me, what's the most important thing? What's, what's the most important thing there, Jesus? And Jesus would listen to this guy, and he knew the stature of his heart. And he responded with this answer. You want, me to, you want me to tell you what the most important thing is? All right, he said in Matthew 22, 37, he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You want to know what's important? Love God with all of you. Right? Love God with all, every fiber of your being. To worship him, to glorify him, to love him in all that you do. And, and the way that you love him is by loving other people and showing them grace and having some empathy and some compassion. And here's the thing, you don't have to be angry to do that. You don't have to be ticked to be loving. In fact, I've been all through the Bible multiple times and I can't find anywhere where it says you have to win the argument. But I see a lot of places where it says you have to be loving. So do you want to make a point or do you want to make a difference? <coughs> so I'm not going to stand here and tell you that this isn't a hard message for me to preach because as a Marine and a retired police officer, you know, part of me wants to stand up here and say, you know, you've got to get righteously angry and you've got to stand for the truth and you've got to win at all costs. But the Holy Spirit within me says, oh, you can be righteously angry and stand for truth, but be loving. And after that, it's up to them. They have free will. Right? They will kneel before our Lord someday and answer to him. Not to you, to him. In fact, when I was a police officer, Monty can attest to this, um, anger is not helpful. Right? When, 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 when you want to get through a situation, you need to be cool, collective, precise, and use your intellect and your wisdom. And most of the time, that works. Most of the time. And occasionally, things had to go another way. But even then, we had to be cool, calm, collective, and precise. Hearts are rarely changed by anger and accusations and judgment. They're usually changed by empathy and compassion and discussion and love. We want to leave with love and not anger. So if you find yourself a little bit like me, you know, just kind of getting annoyed with uh, everything that's going on out there, you know, he said, she said, and, and, and look, I've got really strong opinions. Just ask Anna, right? I mean, I've got really strong opinions. 
Okay, but I don't want my opinions to overrule my calling to share the love of Jesus and get sidetracked by little things that are not nearly as important as sharing the gospel. So let me close with this today. Just a couple quick tips on how we can let go of our anger and not be offended. And the first one, you know, it seems really basic, but lower your expectations of others. Lower your expectations of others. So what will happen a lot of times is someone's going to lie to you or they're going to let you down. They're, they're not they're going to betray you. They're not going to show up on time. They're, 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 gonna, they're not going to call you back or, or text you back or email you. or They're not going to be there for you. They're going to forget about that thing you, for, you did for them and not say thank you. And or they're going to forget your birthday. Whatever it is. And you're going to get really disappointed. But let me ask you, have you ever disappointed somebody in your life? Now, be honest, because you're in church, yeah. right? Have you ever disappointed anybody, mm -hmm. right? So what did you expect, right? They're, they're no different than, than you are, right? If you want to know what you can expect from people, Paul tells us, he says, people will be lovers of themselves, lover of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And you're shocked when they don't call you back, right? Sinful people do sinful things. And if you're not Jesus, you're not perfect. People will let you down. And I hate to tell you this, but I am going to let you down if I haven't already. Okay, don't raise your hand if I've already let you down. But it's just the, the way it is. But the second thing I want to encourage you to do is to raise your gratitude for God's grace. Okay, lower your expectations of other people and then raise your, your gratitude for God's grace. Show of hands, how many of you have never sinned in your entire life? I'll wait. Right? You never told a lie, you never envied anything, you never looked at somebody with lust, you know. I could go through a whole list, you never gossiped, nobody here has ever gossiped, right? You know, um, yeah, we've all sinned, right? But yet God loves you and it's by his grace and, it, and through faith, as Paul says, that you're saved. Not by your own works, not by your own holiness, completely of what God did for you. So give thanks to God for that. Be, be thankful. Have an attitude of gratitude. Does that, anybody here remember a message I did a while back called Flying High? I kind of had this little catchphrase. And it was an attitude of gratitude sets the altitude for living. Right? So if you, you set your attitude for gratitude up toward God, you're going you're gonna to have a good outlook. And, you, and your, your life is going to be, even though things are going bad, you're still going to, have a good outlook on life and things are going to go good. But if your attitude of gratitude is heading down toward the dirt, crash and burn, right? That's what's going to happen. And remember, for God so loved the world. Who's the world? Everybody. Including that purchase person you're righteously angry at, right? that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, any of them people, believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's their choice whether they become saved or not, because it's a free gift. They just have to accept it, right? So we love like Jesus did. We lower our expectations and we raise our uh, gratitude and thank God. Give him glory. Give him praise. Give him worship. And, and he, you know, he saved us. He saved us out of his love and his mercy and his grace. It's a good reason to be thankful. Amen.